Good. All right. Welcome to Wednesday night service. Uh, all those join us on Facebook as well. Hey, um, I'm going to just open us up uh, with prayer tonight. Um, and so, yeah, Father, I just pray for uh, just your words to flow tonight, Lord, and your spirit um, to speak through me tonight uh, as I uh, teach this, this sermon that you have given me, Lord. And um, I just pray for ears to be open and, and eyes to be open, Lord, and hearts to be open to what you want to say in this time, Lord. And I pray that your spirit would guide and direct my words, that I would not use my own wisdom to speak, but only yours. Um, and we want to pray for uh, my mom and dad as well on their vacation right now, Lord, that they will have peace and enjoy their time. In your name, amen. All right. Don't touch the quail. I like that one. Oh, yeah, let's do offering. That's a good That's a good thing. <laughs> Need to do that. I even got messaged specifically, make sure you take out the offering, but, yeah. There we go. All right. Rewind a little bit. Don't touch the quail. I'm excited about this one. So recently, I've been reading, uh, well, I felt like God was prompting me and telling me to read through the, the Old Testament, which is something that I've never done and always tried to avoid. But, <laughs> yeah, everyone gets it, I think, a little bit. Um, but back in, when was that day? Back in July, June? I think all. Yeah, June. Um, I started the Old Testament, and I, I'm only on numbers right now, so I'm really trying to take my time and really get things into focus and everything like that. And the reason I started Numbers, how how many people's favorite book of the Bible is Numbers? <laughs> no one. There's great stuff in Numbers, and I'm learning that. It's not just Numbers. Yeah. There's, there's actual stuff. <laughs> um. And it's crazy because, like, so far, like, you know, I was like, oh, I'm going to be the typical, so far Exodus is my favorite book of the Bible, there's a lot in that. But Numbers is quickly becoming my favorite book of the Bible, like, favorite book of the Old Testament, um, with just what's in here and and how God's been showing me things. And that's and that's where this lesson came from of don't touch the quail. Um, a little fun fact before I get into it. I was looking this up, and in, in this region where the Israelites were, um, in this in this section of numbers, when God provides the quail for them, uh, the people who actually live there, the quail migrates at that time, and just in a couple of days they catch millions and millions and millions of quail, just with nets, in that time to eat, which is crazy. So it's actually a pretty big migration spot. But I want to back up a little bit, and you know, as I was reading through this, God started to really teach me about just being being led and how to be led like through numbers and i'm a person i I like a lot of order riley knows this i when i sit down to watch tv i'll take the remote and put it at like right angles to match the corner of the coffee table or my glass specifically somewhere and and have things match up so i I really like reading about just god's order in things you know like you guys know we have a god of order he likes things in order he likes things organized so if you're messy, get in order. There you go. <laughs> that that's the new title. <laughs> if you're messy, get in order. Um, but I, I I love it. I, I love reading about how God is is really focused on getting Israel organized in numbers. He's like, all right, you've done this. We have the laws now. Now it's time to get in your groups and be organized in the way that I want you to be. You know. So I'm reading I'm reading through this and this. Part of this happens in Numbers chapter 8 um, with, with the tribe of Levi. You know, all the other tribes at this time, they all got chosen to be part of kind of like a war party when they went on movements and stuff. They would kind of be the first groups to leave, and all these other tribes are chosen to 
oh, when this when the trumpet sounds, you guys will be the first tribe to leave and kind of set the way for the rest of them. And, and then this next group will leave and this next group will, will leave. You know, and I, f- I figure if I was in that time and, like, I got chosen to be part of, like, the group that could potentially be the first, like, to meet an opposing army or something like that, I'd be like, yeah, like, let's go. You know, that's going to be amazing. But then you have the tribe of Levi who is chosen to simply do a few things. Just God says, you know what? The, the tribe of Levi are going to be my people. This tribe isn't going to travel like the rest of them. And he says, they're, gonna, they're basically going to carry the tabernacle every place that you move. You know, and I was trying to add up how many times just through like Exodus and Numbers that Israel moves to different locations a lot. And I and someone correct me on if I'm wrong on this, but I, I was looking and it looks like it's like 42 different times in the 40 years. Which if you look up how many times the tribe of Levi would have had to pack up the tabernacle, which the supports alone and the pillars for the tabernacle was 19,000 pounds, that they had to pack all this up and then put it back together. 42 different times every time they traveled somewhere. That's quite a lot. But I started looking, and the, the tribe of Levi, like, like God does something very specific with them. You know, he, 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 tells, he tells Moses in Numbers 8, chapter, or chapter 8, num- verse 6, he says, Take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them ceremonially. Thus you shall do to them, cleanse them, sprinkle water of purification on them, and let them shave all their body, let them wash their clothes, and so make themselves clean. And so we see that what God starts doing with the tribe of Levi is he, is he starts to set them apart. You know, when he tells them to shave their body and to become clean, it, it, it's, it's basically a reference of they're being born again. You know, this is, this is a new start for them. This is, they're, they're stepping into something new. And then even beyond that, God tells Moses to gather the rest of Israel, and they all lay their hands on the tribe of Levi and start praying over them. And I think it's Aaron at that time. He offers the tribe of Levi up to God as a wave offering, which was basically saying, God, these are your people. Do with you what you want with them. You know, so these people were set apart. They were given to God. You know, which, like, we want to be like that too, right? I want to be, I want to be, born again, like we're, we're born again, right? I want to be set apart for the work God has, you know? But the crazy thing to me about this is they were set apart for a work that was basically just cleaning and moving the tabernacle. I think there was a lot more to it, but from a biblical sense, we, we, we figure out, you know, a lot of what they did was they packed up the tabernacle and moved it to where it needed to be. They would set it up. They'd probably clean up every time there were sacrifices. They'd do different things like that. But they had to be so set apart from to do this work to where literally like everyone in Israel laid their hands on them and, and said, God, these are your people. Do what you want. Like, I start, God, God was speaking to me with this, and it was like, we are set apart that way too. You know, I need to wake up in the morning, and I need to go, God, like, I am yours today. I am yours always. Do what you want with me today. You know? And... You know, I view, I, when I was reading this, I viewed it as like, that's such a menial task, packing up, moving things, putting it somewhere else. But they were so set apart for the most menial task. How, how am I supposed to react when God gives me a menial task to do? Or tells me to go somewhere that I don't want to go? Or tells me to speak to that person I don't want to speak to or forgive that person that I don't want to forgive? You know, how do how do I act towards that? You know, I don't have to go pick up nineteen thousand pounds worth of stuff and go take it somewhere. Forgiveness might feel like nineteen thousand pounds sometimes, but you know, God still calls us to do that. And so I started, I started really kind of focusing on this and, and reading into this. You know, they were set apart for what it's the service of the tabernacle and the service of the Lord. And, you know. I believe that when we're born again, the same thing happens to us. We're set apart for the service of the Lord to do what He has to, to do what He has for us, to do what He wants us to do. And if you go to Numbers eight fifteen, I don't have these probably up here, but it says, After the Levites 
So after after that, so after all of the ceremony, after all of the cleansing, after all of the consecration of the Levites, after that, the Levites shall go into the service of the tabernacle of meeting. You know, and so right after they were cleansed, they go into the service of the Lord. There's not, ooh, uh, let me wait five days on that, and then I'll go do my task. It's right after they were cleansed, they were they immediately went to the service of the tabernacle. There was no time. They immediately did it. And again, when God tells us to do something, <laughs> do we want to wait a minute, five minutes, a day, a week? What if that time passes and that? What if we miss that opportunity that God leads to? I had this happen recently. Um, I was at work and uh, I it was time it was time for me to go, but I, I offered to help someone before I was leaving uh, for the day for work, and I ended up driving to the wrong uh, condo unit. To I thought they were at a different one, and so I drove about 10 miles past and went to the next one down. And so I called them and I was like, I was like, you're not at this one, are you? And they were like, no. <laughs> They're like, I'm I'm back at this one. And I was like, I was like, oh well, like I can I can come back. And they and they said, no, just you're you're close to your house now. Just go home, like go home. And I felt the Holy Spirit say, don't go home. Go help them. You know, this person was doing it all by themselves. You know, they were going to be working pretty late. And the Holy Spirit said, go help them. And I didn't. And that stuck with me. That did. Like, I, I felt guilty about it. I told, I told my parents about it. The next time I saw them, I told Riley about it. I was like, I really messed up today. God gave me a task to go do that I, that I very clearly heard. And I, and I chose not to do it just because I wanted to be more comfortable and go home and sit down. You know, I think that, I think it still weighs on me a bit, but I, I don't want to miss. I want to go immediately into the service of the Lord, especially after that happened. You know, once you, once you miss something, you realize what you miss, and you don't want to do that again. You know, yeah. God's kind of, at least, thank God there's grace and forgiveness and things. And I believe that the moment's going to arise for me to be able to actually listen the next time and go. And that that time is in the past now. But I, I want to go immediately into the service of the Lord. Anytime he tells me to do something. The, the moment that he says, you know what? There's a person at Starbucks that needs to be, their drink needs to be bought today. It's going to show them my love. You don't know how, but it's going to happen. What do you do? Yeah. Oh, maybe maybe they'll be there in an hour. I'll go in an hour. I re- I really need to finish this task that I'm doing because I'm really focused on it. But when God says do it, you do it. You don't wait. You be led in it. You be led by it. You know. I I want to start waking up every morning and saying this. You know, I I am yours, God. Do what, do what you want with me today because I am in your service. I want to wake up with that attitude, with that mindset, not going, oh, another day of, of pain. Can't wait for it. Nothing's going to happen today. You're just limiting what God can do to, through you and through someone else in that day and what you could do for someone else in that day. We're getting to the quail part, don't worry. You know, and continuing on through numbers, you know, that, that leads into, okay, I've been, I've been set apart. I, wa- I want to do the work of the Lord. I want to do the service of the Lord. And, you know, I want to be led. I want to be led by God. You know, and, and what does it mean? I, I want some answers. What, what does it mean in your life to be led by God? When you wake up in the morning, what does it mean to be led? Anyone? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. You know, when I want to be led, you know, I, I, I know that God is, is going to guide me. He's going to lead me. He's going to protect me. He is with me wherever I go. I don't have to worry about embarrassment because it doesn't matter what that person thinks about what I just said. It only matters that I did what he told me to do. Right? That is. 
That's a big one. The, the fear of man, you know? Oh, it, 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 I, can't, I, I, I get so mad at myself sometimes when I'm like, you know, I, I like worship in my car sometimes when I'm driving. And I'm so, I'm so apprehensive to put up my hands in the car because I'm afraid of what someone in the other car beside will think. When are they going to see me again? <laughs> and, what do, and what does it matter? Well, what does it? What does it even matter? You know. Yeah, it's, it's just stop. Stop worrying about what other people think when you go tell people that. That's for someone. Stop. Stop caring about what others think. Stop caring about what your parents think. You know, just go do it. You know. And as and as I was kind of studying this, you know, and and being led, I, I looked at. Numbers chapter 9, so so this happens after uh, the Levites have been set apart and consecrated to go. And I think it's so cool that God just had a giant cloud over them that they could see at all times, and by night it was fire, and it lit the way for them. You know, I, I just think that shows so much of, like, what God is. You know, you know, the fire at night, we're like, okay, like, that provided light for them at night so they could see where to go and stuff like that, but the cloud in the day also provided shade and coolness, and that peace over them. And, you know, I, I thought about this, because me and Riley, we, we were, I hope she doesn't mind me sharing this, but we, we were talking the other day, and we were struggling a little bit, you know, because me and Riley, we, we, the last few years, our lives have been God saying, go here, do this, and it's always in another country, it's always somewhere else, it's always somewhere new, it's always leading a team here, leading a team there, getting to experience new things, and always going somewhere new. And, and when, when we first came back to Nebraska and then South, when we first came back to the States, our original plan was like, okay, like we're going to get married, do our honeymoon, and then go immediately back into missions and be going all over the place again. You know, that, that, was, that was our plan. That was our intention. And mistakenly, that's what we thought was going to happen. <laughs> and about almost a year later, you know, we're still in missions. Myrtle Beach is my mission field right now. This young adults group is my mission field right now. You know? And, I, and, I, I, you know, and, we, and this was, I read this verse right as soon as me and her were struggling with this. It's like, you know, like we're, we're getting a little antsy. We're like, okay, God, like, call us to the next place. Like, tell us where to go. Tell us where to go. Like, we're ready. Like, you know, get us out there. And I read this, and, you know, any time the cloud would leave the camp, Israel would pack everything up, and they'd follow that cloud where it went. And then the moment it would settle down, they would build their camp back up and settle down where the cloud was. And then the next time it lifted, they would follow. And then it, when it set down, they would set back down. But then I read, you know, I was like, okay, like, go and stop and go and stop. You know, they're going all over the place. And then in Numbers 9... 22 through 23, I read this, and I, <laughs> I told Riley right after I read it, I was like, I'm like, babe, yeah, this is for us. I was like, <laughs> this is really for me and you. And it said, whether it was two days, a month, or a year that the cloud remained above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would remain in camp and not journey, but when it was taken up, they would journey. <laughs> yeah. It's not my right to go where I want to go. Not, a, not as a child of God. Not as, a, not as a servant. Not as a person in the service of the Lord. It is not my right to say, you know what? Retiring in the Bahamas is going to be great when I turn 60. That sounds miserable to me. I don't know about anyone else. But, like, that's not my right because when, when we are being led, the moment that that cloud gets up, the moment that God tells you get up and go, you go. And wherever it sets down, you set down. And that's what happened with me and Ryan. And God opened my eyes. It's like, like, no joke. This just came. Like, when we were in Australia, we, we thought we were going to be there another three years. Then we were there. Another two or three years. We were like, okay, like, this is where we're going to be. We're going to get married. We're going to come back. And, you know, yeah. It happened right out of the blue. I always teased her about going back to America. And she was like, no, I never want to go back. <laughs> like, I want to be out here. And um, 
And I would always tease her, but kind of like in a real kind of way, because I was like kind of wanting to go back to the States, but she'd be like, can't have children, but I wasn't. Um, but we had, we had settled on that thought. It's like, okay, we're going to be here three years. You know, we're, we're going to be here for a while now. And let me tell you, it was like one day it happened. The cloud lifted. Riley came up to me, and she said, we're supposed to leave Australia. And I went, oh. I was like, well, give me some, some time to just, like, pray about that. And I think God speaks quicker to women than he does men sometimes because we're a little bit more stubborn. <laughs> and uh, I took some time, and I, and I prayed about it. And, and it was the, the, you know, God told us to leave, and we when we left, it took, what, five weeks for us to pack up our entire lives over years and then move all the way across the world again because God told us it was time to go. And then the cloud settled here. And so we settled here. So how do you react when God says, time to go? And you go. You know, I, I, I love to share this story because I think this applies to my parents as well. You know, when they first, when, when, I, when I was really little, when they first lived in South Carolina, I was two, and they felt like God was telling them, okay, like, prepare yourself. It's getting time to, it's getting time to move somewhere new. It's getting time to, to, to go on from here. And my mom, she would always say, uh, she always said, I'll go anywhere but West Virginia. <laughs> she said, I'll go anywhere but there. And you know what happened? They lived there 10 years. <laughs> they had to set camp up there 10 years. We know all that God did in that time because they listened. All the people that God was able to speak to and, and impact and, and be brought to him in that time because a few people listened and went and were led by God to go. So who wants to be led? You know? And who just wants to, to go whenever he says go? Yeah, I think that's a little harder than we think it is sometimes. I think that's hard. But how many of us want to stay where he tells us to stay even in hard times? Yeah? Because what, what, when we are with God, when we are led by God, he protects us. He is with us. He guards us against everything. And we have a life set apart for us. And you know the best part? He provides everything we need for us in that time. Anything we need, wherever he has put us, to survive there, to thrive there, to live there, he gives, he gives us. So even if it's somewhere that's making you freak out in your mind or anything like that, you got to have the peace that God is going to provide everything you need in that time. And you got to have that peace that you are there for a reason, even if that reason doesn't happen until two years down the road. you got to still keep believing. you got to be led even in the times that you feel like you're not being led, in those times of the wilderness like that. I wrote in my notes here, we have, to have a, we have to have a simple response to when God leads us, and it, and it simply is, I will go. Here I am, I will go. Send me. You're right. You know, you stay where God leads you no matter how long it is, and no matter how short it is, because the work he's going to do there is better than you could ever expect. You know, me and Riley kind of struggled with the thought of being in, in the States for a while. But I think we would agree God's opened up so many doors for us here in ministry that we never thought would be possible. But we have to be willing to say, I will go. I will do this. So we want to be set apart, right? And we want to be led, right? We want to go where he says go. Stay where he says stay. Right? All right. And this is when the quail comes in. I told Riley I was going to say this. That juicy, delicious quail that lands right in front of you. And it's sitting there. Does, anyone, does everyone know this story in numbers at all about the quail? Yeah? I love this one. You know, speaking about when God leads us and guides us. He provides for us. He protects us. He watches out for us. 
people of Israel had everything they needed. They had the presence of God right in front of them, directing them, guiding them. They had protection. They had an army. They had the means to defeat any enemy that rose against them. You know, they had they had food, as much food as they wanted. You know, and I, and I was reading into that, and it, like, you know, it's manna. They got a little sick of manna. But, you know, I was, I was reading into manna. It, it was basically healthy donuts. You're going to get sick of that. You know you know the joke where it's like, uh, do you guys know who Tim Hawkins is? The Christian comedian? He did a joke where he's like, he's like, we sit there eating junk food and with a Cheeto we, we eat it and we say, Lord, turn this into a carrot on the way down. You know? And like God literally did that with manna. It tasted like fried donuts, but it was healthy. <laughs> it gave them the energy they needed. It gave them everything that they needed nutrient-wise in that time. In the desert, where it is fell to them. But they started to get a little sick of it, you know. And in Numbers 11, 4, it says, Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense cravings. And so the children of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? You know, it's, it's interesting when it, that, that specific part of that verse says, they yielded to intense cravings. You know? How many times do we yield to the intense cravings of the flesh? You know? They, they wanted meat. They, 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 wanted, they wanted something they could bite into and tear up. They were ready. And you know, I'm sure if they would have just if, if Israel would have just got on their knees and, and, and prayed and asked God, like, Lord, we love what you have sent us. We love, like, manna, and you are our provider, and we ask you that we could have meat, like, every, like once in a while, every time. I, I personally believe that God would have been like, you know what? Yes, I, I will provide this. I'm your provider. Ask me for it, and I will provide. But, you know, they started complaining. And they were taken by this intense desire for it, where it just drew them away from, from what God was trying to do in them at that time. And this, this intense craving, which, funny enough, if you go to um, James 1.4, James talks about this. I should just know this verse for about that. Um, or James 1.14, sorry says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And so you have Israel that has everything they need. Everything. And then they start getting this, this, this craving and this enticement for meat. And they start whining about it. And they start complaining about it. And they start begging for it. And they, they, they complain to Moses. And I, and I find it really funny because it creates kind of this like, aftershock effect where you know the people of Israel are all whiny and complaining and then God gets mad at them and then they go and complain to Moses and then Moses gets mad mad at them and then while Moses is mad he goes and talks to God and they're both mad <laughs> doesn't sound like the best of situations to be in I feel like if I was an Israelite at that time I'd kind of be like cowering away a little bit like what's going to happen this can't be good <laughs> you know um and it got, it got so bad that, that Moses, he wasn't really doing this in the right way, but, but he said to God, he's like, why have you given me these babies? He literally says, why should I be the mother that walks around nursing them? He literally calls Israel like a bunch of, of whining, crying babies at this. And, you know, God, God eventually does answer their prayers for quail, but it's this, it's this intense desire. And this is why you've got to watch out for the quail. You know, I, I wrote down... Israel had everything they needed. They had, they had manna, they had protection, they had light, they had guidance, they had shade, they had God pre God's presence walking among them in their camp, staying in their camp with them. They had an army, they had a priest that they could go to and, make, and, and do the sacrifices they needed to, to cover them. You know, they, they had everything. And then one little thing came in their way at this moment that enticement, 
that drew them away, and they yielded to it. You know, and, and this is what I'm trying to get to is we can be led by the Lord. We can be set apart for the Lord. We can be doing his work, and, we, and he, can, he can lead us, and we can follow. But, it, but every now and then, that quail's going to land beside you, that meat. And it's going to start drawing you in. And it's going to start enticing you. But you you got to say no. You can't go towards the quail. Does anyone want to be led away from what the Lord is doing for you? No? I wouldn't think so. I hope not. But we can't yield to the intense cravings of the flesh. You know, when I, when I am... When I, when I'm in the service of the Lord and set apart, I have to guard my heart. I have to guard my mind. I have to guard it against the things that are going to come against me and try and draw me away from the work that the Lord is trying to do. And I had this happen so many times. I was thinking back on this. I had this happen to me so many times, especially when I was in missions, you know, because I wasn't making any money. I was having to live off of what others gave me. You know, it's kind of funny. I was having to live off of God's provision, much like Israel at this time, but I still wasn't satisfied at times. And these opportunities would rise up for work back home, work in different places, and I would, I would seriously start considering it and start thinking about it and be like, okay, like, here I am sitting in a medical ship in Papua New Guinea going to places that no one hardly ever gets to go to help give health care to people that never get it. And then there's this opportunity to make money kind of fluttering off in the distance that starts enticing me and drawing me away from where I need to be. And, you know, you got to watch out for that. I, had, I, I almost fell into it. And I, I thank God that he, he called me back. He's like, no, that's not what I have for you in this time. And being led, right? Being led back to God in those times. And so we got to watch out for that quail because it's not, it's not going to be some nasty, dirty bird that lands towards you. It's going to be some of the, something, that, something that you like, something that you want, somewhere you want to go, something that someone's going to offer you for free, and you got to determine whether or not this is the best idea for you to take it or not, whether it's the best, best thing that God has in your life right now. And you got to watch out for that. You know, we got to watch out for the lusts and desires that can take over our mind when we are in the service of the Lord. You know when the devil tries to get you the most? Anyone? Yep. It's when you're, it's when you're on the right track. It's when you're doing the work of God. And that's when those things are going to try and come towards you and take you away from that. Because the devil does not like it that you are about to reach the people that he's been trying to get. The devil doesn't like it that you're walking a straight line with God, walking towards him and with him, when he can try and get you off track to lead you astray. And by leading you astray, he can lead other people astray. He knows the things that work, right? He knows the things that work on you. When you look at, it was something as simple as meat that drew away Israel that, it, that ended a lot of their lives, actually, because of the sin they committed. Yeah. The moment they bit into it, while it was still between their teeth, they dropped dead. They were struck by a plague. You know, you got to watch out for it. And it's, it's going to be that thing that you want, that your flesh wants, that you have to keep fighting and saying no, you know. And it's interesting too. I, I find it interesting. I'll touch on this. Um, if you notice, Israel looks back. If you go to Numbers eleven, uh, five through six, and they say, they say, "We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt: the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes." You know and. They started reminiscing 
on their lives before God had delivered them. So they started reminiscing about their lives before they lived with God. And I think if we're not too careful, we can do that as well. Because, you know, Riley told me, uh, uh, who told you this? The Oh, this was one of our speakers. We had this speaker one time, and she was talking to her brother. And he was talking about finances and all this money and stuff like that. And, and um, she, she said, well, you know what is free? She said, following Jesus. And he looked at her. He wasn't saved. He, he, he wasn't a believer. And he, he went, you're wrong. He's like, because when I do that, I have to give up everything. He's like, that's not free. I have to give up everything. Is that what she said? It'll cost me everything. You know? And these people are, are, are reminiscing about their time before God, saying, oh, our time in Egypt was so, was so great. We had food. We had, we had all this stuff. We, we had melons we could eat. We had meat. We had cucumbers. We, you know, everything. Like, they forget they were in slavery. The, in being beaten, being killed, they woke up, they woke up and from, from sunrise to sundown, they were whipped and beaten and had to, to work in slavery. You know, but that but that's the funny thing is, is like when sin tries to draw you away, you don't remember the bad that it causes in your life. You you remember the good that it does for your flesh, but you don't remember the bad that it brings in your life. And we have we have a tendency to romanticize those things, romanticize the times when we are sinning and we aren't living for God and saying that it that it's better. I I struggled with that when I was um. In Bible college, about five years ago, four years ago, um, there was a time in my life that I was really struggling with my relationship with the Lord, and the devil knew exactly what to bring into my life to entice me and draw me away. He knew exactly what to do in that time, and he got me rem- he it got me reminiscing about my life before all that, my life before Jesus became my Savior, my life before. I was walking with God, and it got me reminiscing about how, man, I could do anything I wanted in that time, and it didn't affect me. You know, now now if I even go back to that stuff, there's just conviction in me of how miserable I would be, of how guilt-ridden, I would, and not from God, but, but just me, of how guilt-ridden I would be for not walking with the Lord when I know how good He is, when I know how well He provides for me. And it's not about just what he gives me. You know, we don't walk with God just because of the things we get. We walk with God because of the relationship with him is better than anything we can ever imagine. But that conviction to, to say, God, life with you is so much better than my life without you. My life with you is so much better than when I could go and, and live like the world. Then when I could go out and drink with my buddies and wake up the next morning and have the biggest hangover ever and think that was awesome because looking back on that now, that's not. <laughs> that was nothing. But when I can wake up to a life with God, talk to Him in the morning, Him talk back to me, hold a conversation with Him, creator of the universe, lover of my life, lover of my future family, my future children, the future generations beyond me, protector of them, and I get to wake up and just have a conversation with him instead of wasting my life away doing the stuff that I used to do. I mean, how great is that? You've got to watch out for those things that entice you and try and draw you away, you know? So watch out for the quail, that little quail that comes flying in and tries to take you away from from what, what you're, where you're supposed to be, from where God's leading you. I mean, I, I don't want to take any steps back. Does anyone else? All right? I think we have a tendency to believe that when we take a step back, it takes 20 steps to get back to where we were. That math doesn't really add up, does it? So watch out for the quail. Be led. Be set apart. You go where he goes, you stay where he stays, 
when you guard your heart and you guard, guard your mind against the things that are going to try and entice you and lead you away. And that's what I got. There you go. Has anyone missed Battlefield of the Mind yet? <laughs> All right, I'll pray and then we uh, can be dismissed. Father, thank you for this time, Lord. Um, I just thank you for how good you are to us. Uh, in the times that we don't even realize it, Lord, and, and the times that we look at what's in front of us and we can't see that it's good. Lord, thank you for just how you guide us and you lead us, Lord, that you, that you are a God that, that wants us to follow you, that wants us to walk with you, where you want to leap, where you want to take hold of our hand and just run with us, Lord. Thank you for being a God that does that. And I just want to pray for your, just your protection over everyone online, everyone that's part of this church, everyone in this room, Lord. Your protection over our hearts and minds, Lord. And I, I speak against anything in the name of Jesus that is trying to entice people in this room right now to take them away from from your plan and where you want to take them, Lord. We speak against that. In the name of Jesus, and we say you have no right and no place to be near them. And just thank you for how good you are, Lord. Thank you for being the God who provides and who protects. And thank you that we forever get to grow closer to you, that we never reach a, like a peak, Lord, but we always get to keep climbing. And I pray these things in your name. Amen.